Hello and welcome to the Smart Women in Business vlog. I'm your host, Jane Mackay. Earlier this year, I spoke with Kate Maria O'Brien, fierce leadership coach and founder of She, Australasia's largest women's leadership empowerment event, about her incredible life journey and what brought her to leadership, how she had to overcome addiction and overcome the feeling of the need to conform to create a unique personal brand and make a huge impact on the world. There was a delay in publishing this due to COVID. I wanted to be sensitive to where we are in this time of the pandemic, but I think now the time has come to publish this vlog. I hope you enjoy it. There is a language warning on this episode. To find the show notes for this episode, head to my website, jaymackaycommunications.com.au forward slash blog. Hello and welcome to the Smart Women in Business blog and podcast. Today I am talking to Kate Marie O'Brien all the way over in sunny Bali. Kate lives and breathes personal leadership. She is the founder of She, Australasia's largest women's leadership and empowerment event and over the last 15 years has personally smashed through major glass ceilings again and again and again demonstrating all that she stands for in being able to rewrite our own futures kate was once addicted to drugs anorexic and suffered from social anxiety and nowadays she's a highly regarded leadership coach sought after speaker and is well known for her down-to-earth teachings and bullshit free approach to creating breakthrough results welcome kate yay thank you, so much, thank, you. thank you thank you so tell me about your journey because it's been quite an amazing one and how you got to where you are now Mm. Oh, step by step, smashing on my face, picking myself up, mopping off my little bruised knees, getting back in the game again and again and again and again. I would say that, um, you know, you talked a little bit about the drug addiction and the eating disorder. Like I have, I've certainly hit rock bottom and I, that became, I suppose, the platform to stand back up strong and um, just keep going. But I think where, how I've got here, there was actually no original big plan or vision for it. I, I, where I'm at now, I wouldn't have even been able to see. I didn't have the vision to see this. Um, but what I did tr learn to trust and follow was just that little nudge on the inside that says, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm here for something. And I even remember the day that I sort of decided that maybe I wasn't a mistake. And I know that sounds so simple and ridiculous, but up until then, I kind of had it in my head that I had to be someone else. And if I was a little bit more polished like that person or a little bit more knowledge like that person, or if I was, maybe didn't have the experiences that I did, maybe if I didn't have like F up those four or five years on addiction and eating disorders, like then I'd be further along than what I was. So that was the world in my head that I lived in for years. And the experience on me was one of, I'm actually not supposed to be like this with this kind of, you know, I suppose in one way I'm a little bit smart, you know, I've got some smartness and some intelligence and some articulation, but on the other hand, I'm a little bit rough around the edges. And maybe I have to polish those edges out a little bit to be a little bit more palatable for people, you know, all of this just nonsense. But I remember the day that I actually realized like, oh, maybe someone didn't make a mistake when they made me. Oh, what? So what would that then mean? Shit, maybe I was supposed to go through those things. Oh, maybe I'm supposed to have had the childhood I did to give me a certain type of perspective and viewpoint that just brings another little flavor into the world and a slight different perspective that maybe I can help some kinds of people that maybe wouldn't connect with those kinds of polished types. Fuck it. What if I stopped actually trying to change myself and I just stepped into more and more and more of me? And then what if I even fucking didn't give a shit about that? What if I just think, think actually, what is that thing that I feel called to? What do I want to do? And I put my focus on that and then just rolled up my sleeves and took the actions. That's been the process. And so, <laughs> you know, yeah, fast forward about 15 years from that decision and then one thing in one step in one action has taken me to the next, I suppose, dot on the journey. And that each new dot, I can see the next big dot. And it's just been a process of connecting the dots 
on a daily basis in showing up on a daily basis in then inside of all of that having a context wrapped around that that when I feel like shit because I'm stepping into something that I have no freaking idea how to pull off and it is challenging the pants off those little parts of me that just want to go watch Netflix sometimes I do it <laughs> sometimes when, you have a nap <laughs> that, I, oh my god I love naps oh, but so when that I. actually happens there's just a bigger context for it all that means that I don't run and hide like a different version of me that doesn't have that context would. This morning, you know, my husband and I, we've been together for 17 years. We've been married for 12 years. We've got two teenage kids. We've got our relationship to where it is because we've constantly been willing to have the conversations that would call us into a new level of our marriage. And it's a constant, honestly, it's actually a process, a constant process of death and rebirth. Because to step into a new level of relating, we've got to, sounds dramatic, but kill off the old relationship. We sat there this morning at our kitchen table as the kids left for school this morning, and we had a challenging conversation that all parts of me wanted to punch my way out of. You know, I felt, I felt just all the resistance in my chest come up. He's inviting me again into a new level of our relationship. And he's going there with or without me. Mm. And, and as people, we resist discomfort. Our, our brains and our instincts want to keep us safe. And that's yeah. one of the things of being in business. It's not always going to be comfortable. No, it's because our, be brain, easy. our brains are actually wired. When you look at like neuros, on a neuropsychology, Neuro, yeah. The left part of our brain is wired to for meaning and interpretation, and it should have chatters away from us from morning to night. And when there's something outside of us in our current environment looking us in the eye, and at the same time, not that it's causative, but it's at the same time of showing up of an uncomfort in our body, what we do, our brains are so masterful, they go, this feeling inside me that's uncomfortable is related to that thing that we point at in our in our environment, and then our brain interprets the story of out there you cause this, right? Mm. But the thing is, we just are things that have uncomforts come up, you know? So in that conversation this morning, it would have been very easy to have um, tried to stay in the story that my brain was popping out, rather than, you know, so what I ended up saying to him was, I can feel something coming up inside of me. I really hear what you're saying and what you're wanting from this and what, you're, what the invitation is. I can't language at the moment what's up for me, the resistance, but I also want what you want in the bigger picture. I'm just going to have to deal with whatever I have to deal with over the coming days. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in when you bring that into a business context, mm. you've got to have conversations that yeah. aren't necessarily comfortable, whether it's with yourself and on your own business or whether it's mm. with your clients and saying, look, I see what you're doing here. I see yeah. that you're resisting this conversation mm -hmm. because you're scared or because mm -hmm. it brings up a discomfort or it means there's going to be a transition for you. And I think as people and entrepreneurs and women who are growing and we're in our business, there's a constant evolution and there's a constant growth. If we didn't look to the next goal, if we didn't want to strive for the next thing, we wouldn't be in business for ourselves. 100%. Can I, can I check on something there around business? Yeah, absolutely. So I've got a large team. I've got 12 women who work full time on my team. And so, you know, that's been built up over many years and, you know, started with a commitment and then challenged myself every step to keep putting the next person in place and to think outside the box creatively with how I was going to have it happen. So, um, you know, uh, a few weeks ago, I had something where I made the wrong call. I move fast, I make fast decisions and I implement really fast. But a part of that, on one hand, we, we implement fast. On the other hand, we've also got to be willing to be aware of the feedback in our environment of how did that implementation land? Did it get the desired result? And then pivot fast, right? Mm. You know, I, I made a fast call and it was actually the wrong decision. So I realized that night 
It was just sitting in me all day and I'm like, I fucked up, fucked up, made the wrong decision. So that night I was like, I have to, I've got to own it. So it was a process that day, of, that night of ringing each person in my team to say, look, I'm really sorry, that decision I made, I fucked up. And then to own the impact that it had on the team. And I see that, so my point of this is, this is what I see people don't do. Because when we fuck up, it's really our automatic response is to go into self-protection mode. Mm. And then what our brain does is it looks for the reasons and the evidence of why we made the right decision and we become righteous and defensive. And what that does is it closes off possibility. So in, that, in, in, in owning my own screw up that night, the impact, the result that's come out of it is that our team culture got strengthened mm. through being willing to say, guys, I screwed up and I'm so sorry, I made the wrong call. This is the call that I should have made. And to really take a, like a level of deep level of ownership and to thank each person in the team for stepping forward and having what I call courageous communication with me. Mm. What's happened is our, cult, our team culture could have shut down because if I had got defensive. Our team culture opened up and is stronger than ever because of the willingness to, I suppose, say the truth rather than get defensive. Hmm. Do you think that is coming from, and this is, I've had conversations in, on previous podcasts about the rise of the feminine energy in business. And this ownership of communication and courageous communication is a different way to communicate. And I think feel it's a more feminine way of communicating yeah i think um it's a, it's a great question um i think the the work that i do around leadership is and like a deep on the court owning of what we're bringing to situations and circumstances that's causing our environment to show up or not show up and so if something's happening in the team or with my clients, or with my relationship, or with my kids, and it's happening around me, then I can either point the finger and say, you guys need to change this, you guys need to sort that out, and keep it at a distance from any level of my own responsibility, or I can actually look at what am I doing or not doing that's creating this mess or this thing around me, and then make the shift over here. Mm. And that, that ownership and that communication, as you said, can have such deep impacts on culture because there isn't that shame and there isn't anger and there isn't the fear of speaking out, which I think is really interesting um, from, in every element of your life. So mm -hmm. obviously going from you to a, to a team of 12, how has your business evolved and, and where were the signs for you that you needed to change? Mm, yeah. Um, years ago, before I even considered the possibility of building a team, I was uh, mum, two kids, had a national career working for the government in New Zealand, um, building my business, you know, getting up at 3am, you know, the, the drill. And I was super capped. I was super exhausted. My time, my money, everything was capped. And then I was on an interview with Dr. John Martini, and he talked about how he has built a basically an environment where everything's delegated out, like everything, driving, cooking, cleaning, everything, except for his genius and the areas that is his creative craft. And I remember I was gobsmacked by this possibility. And I was like, wow, I'd never even considered that. I want some of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, he was someone who lived under, the br under a bridge at one point. Yeah. He certainly didn't get there because of a handout or an easy process. He got there because he decided and he took the action, and he pivoted along the way, and he got creative. Right. Mm. That day, I decided to do that. And in that decision, right, I decided to do it. I locked it in every day, but also I took action now. Like, i.e., that day I started taking action. Rather than thinking, I'm going to decide, and yes, that's going to be great for my future, but in the next year, I can't. Right? So I started getting creative, and so I looked at you know, how to bring in extra income, at a higher hourly rate than what I could pay for a housekeeper. So I, it was just getting creative, creative. So I think, you know, I'm a strong believer that when we get creative and innovative, we can see solutions and possibilities 
then we just implement. So I got something that I could earn um, enough money in three hours to pay for 15 hours of housekeeping. And it was just, you know, something I learned to do off the internet and did it and found three hours and it leveraged my time. Got the housekeeper in place, that freed up time, I reinvested that. Then the extra money from that, I reinvested into someone 20 hours a week as an assistant. Then that freed me up to bring in a bit more money, increased it to 40 hours. It's just, it's just like that, it's a progressional. But I think the key message I wanna to say to anyone who's listening to this is, you, if you're feeling that you're capped on, on, on whatever level, and you know that there's a level beyond this, and you hear conversations like this, and you're thinking, yeah, I really do wanna have a team where I need to bring an assistant in, I would challenge you to claim that now and then challenge you to decide that you're going to start now and start putting a piece of that in place and challenge yourself to get creative in a way to do that is just as one way is my, you know, the hundred ways how I gain. So if you ask yourself, all right, what is a hundred ways how I could get my next team member in or I could get 10 hours of housekeeping, wherever you're starting from, What's the next thing you want someone to take in? What's 100 ways how? And then write 100 different ways in which you could creatively make that happen. Then choose one of them and start actually implementing. You'll be surprised at what is already available right now. And you don't have to wait another 12 months or two years. Because mm. often we put our plans on hold because I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. Mm. You are ready, actually. Because if you've had the idea and you want that thing... Now is the time to start that. Mm. Now is the time to, to go after that goal because um, you'll never be ready. It's like having a baby. You'll never be ready. <laughs> so how do you manage your life as an entrepreneur with your kids and your team and everything? Mm. I think one of, the thing, one of the things is is that I do have built up to like a great lifestyle. You know, having a large team in place that is highly trained you know I've over the years I've gotten really good at training a leadership team so it's you know I've got the right people employed in the right seats on the bus with the right structures around them um, and literally everything's delegated out I don't do a single thing that's not in my total zone of genius so I think life for me nowadays is different to how it was progressionally to get here mm. um, but yeah my life now looks like uh, I run large training events I create, the, I create all of my own content thinking wise, but then I just hand it over to the team and the team build everything out. So life's different these days, but you know, I suppose what I want to say to anyone listening to this is that mm, anyone can create this, but you do have to get committed and like a deep level of committed to working out the pieces and taking action and following through. Mm. And taking action is the key. Um, mm. Instead of sitting there thinking about it and fantasizing, actually take action. Yes. So what does a great day in the office look like for you? Where's your favorite place to, to be in your business? Yeah, I've got um, a few different days throughout the week. I'm quite a big one on batching. Yeah. So for example, today's Thursday, Tuesdays and Thursdays are appointment availability days. And so just even the way that my schedule is created is pretty laser time efficient. So there's one minute between appointments. So 60 minutes, 60 seconds is all I need to change over between an appointment. And, you know, if there's five minutes gap between, like, I just think that that's five minutes wasted. So, like, the way in which my calendar is set up for Tuesdays and Thursdays, today I've got eight appointments back to back with a break. So everything gets fully batched Tuesdays and Thursdays for appointments, but I still don't start till 11 a.m. on those days. Mm. You know, just by being really time efficient and batching things so well, I've got from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. with when my kids go to school of creative thinking time and that's where I'm really frying my big fish that's where I'm I'm thinking high level and I'm doing my creative thinking when my brain's really fresh and I'm thinking about like the big vision and where we're going and what are the pieces that need to be put in place and I may be creating a few things if you looked around the room if you guys could see there's flip charts everywhere it looks like a, a shit storm because yesterday was full creation mode I was in program creation mode because there was no appointments right but then um yeah, so that's what it looks like. I've got Monday, Wednesday, Friday, which is frying big fish. It's the big stuff that's moving the needle in our business. And then Tuesday, Thursday is super time efficient. And then, you know, I'm also really laser um, clear about availability. I think that's so important. I'm just kind of like more talking like nuts and bolts now, like technical stuff. Yeah. But just 
In terms of availability, I think it's a really important thing that we need to all look at at all points of our journey is how available we are and how we ring fence our availability and when our time availability is. And so, you know, this having client wise, I've got a Voxer app mm. and all my clients can come through Voxer. So yeah. active clients, and as soon as their client program's finished, they're exited out of Voxer. WhatsApp is only for friends and family and team, right? So yeah. no one gets yeah. WhatsApp as a friend or family or team. And, you know, I've only got a couple of friends in there. Everyone else, it's through Facebook and Instagram. So even, you know, when like, I meet someone out, I give them Facebook and Instagram because then we can meet through there. WhatsApp is really protected and guarded. You know, mm. I don't... It's sacred. Pre- really sacred. But mm. then I can know when I'm going to be available for different conversations. You know, I go into the boxer once or twice a day when I'm in a headspace of client-type conversations. I go onto WhatsApp more frequently because I, I, you know, I want to see if the kids have message and that kind of thing. And then even email, no one's got my personal email. It all goes through the company email. And there's really clear um, agreements for the team, even if they get an email through the company email that's for me personally, it still doesn't get forwarded on because then my personal email gets connected, right? Mm. So it's just something, and I've really had to step back and consider what's going to work for me in terms of keeping myself as free as possible while also serving the things that I'm committed to as big as possible. Mm. We making those decisions on how I do that to support myself is, has been uh, a game changer. Because it's one of the things that really does get blurry when you work for yourself and you are your brand are your boundaries. It's so easy for us to try and give and give and give to maximize the value that we're giving for our clients. And then your boundaries get blurred and that's when Mm. things you you're facing burnout because you're always on and you're always in that client giving headspace and you need, you can't be in that space all the time because it's a dangerous place to be constantly because you burn out and you've got to preserve your energy. Yes. And I would even say to that, if anyone is listening to that and, that and you know you're in that space where you are afraid to put down very clear boundaries with clients or potential clients because they might get pissed off and, and not feel served or whatever reason, um, I want to reframe that conversation because it's actually the opposite. People mm. deeply respect when someone deeply respects their own time. And whatever value and level of respect you put on your own time is where people are going to meet you. So one of the key areas to then make that be effective is that up front, you want to be clear about your boundaries, Mm. right? The agreement up front, and it's how you're being within your boundaries, but it's also the upfront spoken expectation. So for example, when someone comes in as a client, they get a client handbook, a full client handbook given to them from my team. And the handbook clear, like clearly clarifies all of the boundaries that we have, how they can be supported, how they can make the most out of the program, what they can expect. And having agreed expectations up front, no one has issues. What causes issues is unspoken agreements. It's the unclarified expectations that actually causes the upsets. And then we get all weird with it. We get all weird. And, and then as a response, then we try and overgive and it just creates muckiness because people can feel that and they feel that there's a lack of boundaries. And so they, they're not going to respect your time either. Mm. And when we are in developing these, these boundaries and creating them around our business, we, also, we just need to also value our own time and we need to put those things in place. And it doesn't matter who you are or how big your business is, whether you're one person with one client or a larger business, you've got to have those processes and systems in place from the start. And you have your client handbook and I have a, you know, a service level agreement and Mm. take the time to do that for your business. So Mm. anyway, I was saying that to all the people out there. Um, So you've mentioned Voxer, any other tools that you just love and live in? Monday.com is the bomb diggity dom. <laughs> it is the best. I've done, I've used a lot of um, project management systems like Redbooth and Asana and Trello. Yeah. And 
monday.com is just the beast. So if, if you haven't got one a project management system, get monday.com. Have you used that one at all? I use Airtable, but okay. I'm just sort of me managing my projects and then I don't got need it. to, haven't got a team. Got it. Yeah. Monday.com, I would say, is, is so good. And so we actually, um, about four months ago, changed everything over from Redbook, which, you know, it's such a big mission to change a whole project mm. management considering how many stuff I've got in there, but it was worth it. That's how much I value this this pro, this system. Yeah, um, I'd say that's probably the main thing that's been useful. The other thing, if, if do you have a lot of people listening to this podcast who are coaches? Yes. Okay, so one thing I found really, 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 really useful is that I've got a system set up that when I am coaching a client in Voxer, and if they come up against something that I know is a reoccurring theme for a lot of people, one of the ways in which I s support them, but also I'm creating something to support many clients in the future around that one thing is that the moment I hear them say, blah, 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 and I'm like, well, they're right up against something that's common, I create a train an audio training for it. Yeah. So I could just answer them one off into the Voxer message, or I could step back and say, what are the things that they really need to hear in this moment that's going to give them an access point? So then I pick up my phone and I record that on my voice message app, yeah. send it to my yeah. team, and my team upload it into SoundCloud and put it on a private link. Then I give that private link to the client in Voxer app and I go, hey, hun, have a listen to this. And then let me know if, you've, you know if you need to talk further beyond this. Then I take that link and I've got an Evernote app on my phone mm. that's for my, my, my training library. And this is where I'm storing all of these training links with little notes for myself. Audio links, I dump the link there and I put this is you know, 10 minutes 30. And it's covering this, 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 and this. And I'm talking about this metaphor. Perfect for a client when da, 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 da. So I've got, you know, this Evernote app on my phone. It's got hundreds of pre-created power conversations that support people. So it's a really effective way that you add major value to your client. But also you're creating things that support your time and energy going forward. So a lot of, you know, people in Voxer with me, they're like, wow, you just provide so much service. Do you know, it is so light on my energy to do that because I've created the back-end systems to support that. Mm. Systems mm. are mm. important. Systems. And preserving yeah. your energy. Yeah. So one of the things that affects every single entrepreneur I know, and I've asked in every single podcast I've ever done, is imposter syndrome. So what are your methods to overcome imposter syndrome and how do you respond to the bad days in business? Yeah, I think I'm going to sort of make an umbrella statement and then I'll drill down. Mm -hmm. My umbrella statement is that um, I really get that we're going to have shitty days and that the shitty days aren't stuff to be kind of thrown out and think that they're a part of something bad. And in fact, if, if we are looking for the gold, then we can see something even in those days. Mm. I came smack up against something that was so different the other day and it was, a, it was a challenging conversation that I just did not know how to navigate. And it would have been easy to have my little interpreter brain go, fuck, if you, if her. Right? And then just feel defensive. Mm. I step back and I'm thinking, what, like, what am I not noticing here? From that conversation, from the inquiry that I was allowed, that I was willing to go in into that conversation, I've created an entirely new program design for this one key piece that I'm filming tomorrow that's going to be a massive service to this and to, and to something bigger. And I've, I've changed a key. Does that make sense? So there was a yeah. major breakthrough through... This thing that happened that was not fun to experience, but because I was willing to stay in the inquiry of what is there for myself to see here. So I guess we can just go, oh, it's a shitty day, blah, 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 it's too bad. But I really get you know, the context of we've got so much to learn. And um, the second piece I wanted to say was that we, in terms of like an ontological level, we have, um, I see, is these little stories in the background that we make up. And my one is that I've done something wrong. And so 
doesn't matter whatever level I go to, the moment I step into the next level, like when I created She, which is Australasia's largest women's leadership empowerment event, and it's just, you know, it's growing each year, it's freaking epic and huge. When I decided to go from the idea to actually, yes, I'm going to do this, declared it out in the world, mm. put my money where my mouth was, it's been a huge investment financially, and created it of course what gets brought up for me is my little tape recorded loop of you've done something wrong you're going to make a mistake blah, 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 blah. Mm. what i get though and this is um is i get that that's going to come up at every level mm. so when it comes up it's actually not such a big thing i mean it's still not comfortable mm. but it's not like oh my god this means something no it actually only means that you're stepping into a new level <laughs> And yeah. every time you into a new level, you're going to feel some level of uncomfort. Mm -hmm. And if you are able to do that work, you'll probably start to put some language into it. And for each of us, we have a, I'm not lovable, or I've done something wrong, or I'm not good enough, or I'm alone. We have our own flavor of that that is like a life sentence throughout our life. Right? It's mm -hmm. called a life sentence ontologically. But if we are able to see it, the meaning to it and then go oh this means that I'm not good enough and the money comes and it comes in huge amounts and then that can be very welcome and yeah and then you live in Bali so <laughs> where can your listeners find out more about you and I will put the links in the show notes but yes, you. yes actually can I give them a recording of something there's nothing yeah else. absolutely when I was at She last time, which is Australasia's largest women's leadership empowerment event, oh my God, we have, everyone left She saying this was the pivotal experience. I feel like just loving themselves and ready to go kick it. It's really cool. But when I was on day two of She, I did a conversation training on stage, but I've got the recording if people want to have it. So go to katemarieobryan.com forward slash training and it's free, there's nothing to sell there, it's literally just to get that 28 minute recording and it's so bloody good, so go watch that. But also you can come connect with me on Instagram or Facebook at Kate Marie O'Brien, that's M-A-R-E-E. And I will put the links in the show notes. And thank you for your incredible time today, Kate. Pleasure, Absolute Jane. Absolute pleasure. Yeah, cool. Thanks.